fond of separating style and content for the purposes of analysis and so on, but they aren't separable. They come from the same place, and style is morality. Style judges. There are many different aspects to style, such as the use of creative devices, diction, grammar, tone, rhythm, cadence, and this is not an exhaustive list. So then, according to Amos, grammar is style, tone is style, diction is style, and in fact, all the literary tools available to and employed by the writer, taken as a whole, are style, and style is morality. Style judges. In studying the history of literature, you find that some of its meatiest and most appealing aspects are literary feuds. Enter William Faulkner and Ernest Hemingway, two outstanding writers with two very different and, in fact, antithetical styles. So, following the thread, these are two writers whose writings contain two very different moralities and judgments of the world. Faulkner is all purple prose, long, ornate, convoluted even. Shaped by his southern Christian upbringing, his writing is almost biblical, or to be more accurate, liturgical. Hemingway, conversely, the cosmopolitan modern man who cut his teeth as a reporter's writing, is short, flitting, concise, pithy in fact, laconic. Part of the so-called lost generation, Hemingway kept company with figures such as Picasso, Joyce, and Zelda and F. Scott Fitzgerald, who of course wrote one of the most brilliant works in the English language, The Great Gatsby. In the introduction to Gatsby, Wordsworth edition, Professor Guy Reynolds writes of Fitzgerald's thematic use of the concept of the flicker of modern life. This same flicker can be captured in Hemingway's writing style, impermanent yet pertinent. The tempos and structures of a writer's sentences reflect the speed of the lives lived, as well as the pulse of the moralities that they contain. Faulkner lounges, basks, you can feel the southern heat and the socio-economics of the southern town in the mere pattern of his words. Hemingway flits at the speed of technological development and the life of the city. The seeming oddity is that even where Faulkner writes of winter scenes, the southern sun somehow still radiates through his writing. And even where Hemingway takes us into scenes of suburbia, such as in For Whom the Bell Tolls, his writing still somehow shimmers with the pathos as well as a swing of the city. To demonstrate their stylistic differences, which stemmed not just from literary competition, but essential idiosyncrasies in their literary aesthetics, and so in their phenomenological aesthetics, and fundamentally divergent judgments on life and the world, Faulkner said of Hemingway, he has never been known to use a word that might send a reader to the dictionary. Hemingway replied, poor Faulkner, does he really think big emotions come from big words? Here are two examples from their works. Faulkner wrote one of the longest sentences in all of American literature, which comes from his novel Absalom, Absalom, 1936. A single sentence composed of 1,288 words in the 1951 Random House edition. And although this sentence is the extreme example, it is not at all atypical of his writing. He writes, Just exactly like father, if father had known as much about it the night before I went out there as he did the day after I came back, thinking, mad impotent old man who realized at last that there must be some limit even to the capabilities of a demon for doing harm, who must have seen his situation as that of the showgirl, the pony, who realizes that the principal tune she prances to comes not from horn and fiddle and drum, but from clock and calendar, must have seen himself as the old worn out canon ad infinitum. Now contrast this with Hemingway from his 1926 novel, The Sun Also Rises. In the morning, I walked down to the boulevard to the Rue Soufflo for coffee and brioche. It was a fine morning. The horse chestnut trees in the Luxembourg gardens were in bloom. There was the pleasant early morning feeling of a hot day. I read the papers with the coffee and then smoked a cigarette. The flower women were coming up from the market and arranging their daily stock. Students went by going up to the law school or down to the Sarbonne. The boulevard was busy with trams and people going to work. If you ask why these two writers, the answer is because they serve as examples of the two acute ends of the spectrum of sentence structure, and a novel, or even an epic, is made up of nothing but sentences. The sentence can be considered the fundamental unit of a work of literature, not the single solitary word, but the contextualized and unfolded unit of literary meaning. Now you could argue 
then the single word is a fundamental literary unit, or, if you're feeling contrarian without substance, even the letter. But the words balcony, poor, autumn, together, are linguistic without being literary. In order for them to become literary, you must expand and unfold their chosen meanings so as to make them part of the sentence, such as, the apartment below mine had the only balcony of the house. I saw a girl standing on it, completely submerged in the pool of autumn twilight. She wasn't doing a thing that I could see, except standing there, leaning on the balcony railing, holding the universe together. You may read a hundred books on how to write, but as a general rule, I have read and discarded many of these as simply the whims of subjectivity, rather than any reliable rule of writing. But there was one paragraph I stumbled upon, which was itself the very demonstration of the art it was trying to teach. And it brilliantly illustrates a somewhere between Faulknerian and Hemingway-esque sentence structure. And in fact, in the journeys to and fro between them, lies the vitality born of variation. From Gary Provost's 100 Ways to Improve Your Writing. And it's all about style, all about morality, all about judgment. And it goes like this. This sentence has five words. Here are five more words. Five word sentences are fine, but several together become monotonous. Listen to what is happening. The writing is getting boring. The sound of it drones. It's like a stuck record. The ear demands some variety. Now listen. I vary the sentence length and I create music. Music. The writing sings. It has a pleasant rhythm, a lilt, a harmony. I use short sentences, and I use sentences of medium length. And sometimes, when I am certain the reader is rested, I will engage him with a sentence of considerable length, a sentence that burns with energy and builds with all the impetus of a crescendo, the roll of the drums, the crash of the cymbals, sounds that say, listen to this, it is important. And so, if style is morality, then it may be that a more expansive and palpitating morality, circumambulating, not fixed and static, not monotonous and rigid, but exploratory and even creative, is closer to a healthy and earthly morality, and one that is needed. Grey areas flowering into bursts of colour, not monochromatic, but kaleidoscopic, diverse. That is the kind that we need, in order that we may create, dare I say it, a better world.